Hi, I'm Dan Mark uh, from the Duke Heart Center and Duke Cardiology Division, and I'm here with Dr. Manesh Patel, who's our Chief of Cardiology, and we are talking about the Orbita trial, a trial, a randomized trial, uh, very important, that just got reported at the TCT meeting in Denver earlier this month. Manesh, can you give us a bit of an overview of what this trial was and why it's caused so much uh, attention and controversy? Pretty impressive to have so much uh, interest in a 200-patient trial, but I think in part it's because of the way the trial was conducted and maybe some of the rigor around the trial. So for those that haven't potentially read it, I encourage them to read it in The Lancet. Um, first, I think we have to congratulate the investigators who really carried out an important study. And what did they do? They, they looked to see if they could quantify the benefit of angioplasty, so opening up a coronary artery in patients who have one coronary artery occlusion or narrowing um, and stable angina. So, you know, what they actually did is they recruited patients who went to the cardiac catheterization laboratory, had one artery with a narrowing in it, weren't there because they had a heart attack or an acute coronary syndrome, and they had to convince everyone there in the United Kingdom that it was reasonable to do the study. I'm glad they did. And the patient and the physicians would then stop the procedure there, consent the patient to see if they'd be interested in the study, they did a stress test and some actually did a functional test of their exercise ability. And then over the next four to six weeks, really titrated the antianginal medications really aggressively. And what do I mean by that? I mean that there was a cardiologist available uh, every day of the week almost, you know, and they, they had several titrations where up to sometimes three times a week they would titrate the medication so that at the end of six weeks, those patients had at least two and a half to three antianginal medications. And they found 230 such patients, and within the conduct of that time, about 30 patients fell out because they started feeling better and, or didn't come back or variety of issues. Then they came back and got randomized to an angioplasty, where they insert the wire and open up the artery with a stent, or a sham angioplasty, where the patients in both arms had a blindfold, earphones, so wouldn't know what was happening. And they actually measured the pressure down the artery, and then whether the pressure was low or not, they did or didn't do the angioplasty based on randomization. They then kept that blinding for the next 30 days or so and then put the patients back on a treadmill and did all the testing again to see what they could find with the hypothesis that for like a new antianginal drug, if, see if stenting could be shown to make people exercise about 30 seconds longer. And what they found was that, in fact, they weren't able to show that, that patients were able to exercise about 28 seconds or so in the angioplasty arm and about 11 seconds or so farther in the sham arm, so a power at least of that feeling of maybe they got the angioplasty. Uh, the Seattle angina questionnaire for angina was pretty high in both groups, so they weren't really maybe as potentially symptomatic as possible, but didn't change that much. But there was a reduction in the stress testing on ischemia, so at least physiologically seemed like it was going to do what it did. But this has really shaken the field a little bit, because a lot of people are saying, oh my gosh, this is new information and really should change the way we think about it. So what is it about the, uh, the sham that makes people so convinced that, that now you hear a lot of criticism that so oh, stenting is just like equivalent to a sham it's no better than a sham and uh, yeah did I, they really show that in orbita or are they over interpreting their data a little bit i, I think the, the authors have not they, they i think nicely just concluded what they showed but a lot of people are putting what i'll say their own feelings and biases onto the study, right? So let me just say that in the most, first of all, they did a really rigor, rigorous study, but if you were really testing the placebo effect, you would have another arm that did not get the sham PCI to quantify how that arm felt so you could actually see the differences. That, that would be number one. The second is, certainly you should see the findings at the 30 days they set it up, but if there is, in fact, a placebo effect there, with time you would envision that maybe that would would vein, you know, just wane away. But I guess I would say what we're seeing a lot of people do is say there was always exuberance about angioplasty. These things don't work as people think. And I think there's always caution with any one study. The, the cautions for me are, first, it's important to recognize for our patients and for our providers, anyone with an acute coronary syndrome having a heart attack, stents have been repeatedly shown, and angioplasty as a procedure has been repeatedly shown to be beneficial to those patients. And we should not lump in all of the same syndromes. That's number one. Number two, I think this was a well-conducted study. It would likely be replicated, hopefully. But these are patients that did have significant lesions, but they had one artery with a narrowing. And how to significant more burden, more arteries narrowed, we want to see if that's the case. So there's something important to remember that the burden of atherosclerosis or ischemia matters. And the third, and I suspect our investigators will show us the findings, 
what were the physiologic differences across those vegetables? You know, did physiology predict improvement? And if we look at the analysis now by the findings of the physiologic testing in the artery, does that help us think about who's getting a benefit? Because then we may be able to better select the patients that need the procedure. It's certainly true that um, prior to Orbita, I think almost everybody assumed that sham use of a sham in a PCI type of procedure was not possible. Yeah, I think the strength of what the investigators did is they probably built upon a little bit of the renal denervation data, right? And we, had, we just conducted a fairly large trial in which we did a sham renal denervation procedure versus a renal denervation procedure and showed, in fact, there was a difference, but again, not a statistically significant difference, and showed us the power of what happens to people's blood pressures if you tell them you've done something to do it, or do they take their medications better, or a variety of regression to the mean, a variety of things we can say. So I think they should, there's kudos for being able to test patients and get people to believe it's worth answering this question. But when people say it's taken us 40 years to get here, it's worth remembering that it took us 40 years to get here from the first time that Grunzik did an angioplasty because we also had anginals that have gotten better. We also better understand which patients should we defer and not defer. And we also now have learned that in the acute setting, opening the artery faster is very useful. So we did take a while to get here, but we got here through learning, not just because we only decided to do it now. Now, I know you've, uh, you're very familiar with the data in the, the ACC and CDR database. What proportion of patients in the database do you think the Orbita trial speaks to? It's important for us to think about that. I, I get the best we could do is looking at the, the National Cardiovascular Data Registry and thinking about the number of patients that have acute coronary syndromes versus stable disease. It looks like about 80% of patients have acute coronary syndromes or hospitalized unstable syndromes versus about 20% of people getting angioplasty now for stable syndromes. And of those 20, 22%, about half have one vessel disease. So somewhere around 10 to 12% of people getting an angioplasty in the United States are probably at least impacted some by the orbit of data. So it certainly has an impact, but that, that's the best we know. And of course, people could talk about coding and things, but I think that speaks to it. I imagine once high sensitivity troponin comes into play, that number of stable patients may actually change if we knew yeah. that those patients are starting to leak myocardial muscle, we think about them differently. And do you think it's practical for um, anybody to change guidelines on the basis of this trial? I mean, are, for, are, are we, for example, going to really do an intensive medical run-in phase in every orbit eligible patient before we consider whether to do a PCI. Almost as powerful as the, as the um, article was, unfortunately, sometimes the editorials. Is, and an editorialist said, well, immediately we should do this, and this is a death nail for angioplasty. I, I believe I that's think a they bit... they nail in the coffin as yeah, the yeah, metaphor. Yeah, nail in the coffin, right. The last nail. The last nail. So I, I believe that's a bit overstated, of course, right? And I worry also that it, it changes the message for patients who are actually having syndromes that can benefit. But I, but I do think what it tells us for the appropriate use criteria and the guidelines is to go back and look and say how, how strongly we're, we're favoring one or the other. There's always going to be patient preference. Patients don't want to take pills sometimes. Patients want to have certain things done. And so I think what we would say is we'll likely continue to emphasize a trial of medical therapy before we do angioplasty. And that was in the guidelines. That was in the appropriate use criteria. But certainly some of those gradations may change. I guess the second thing I would say is it's important to recognize that this was really an unusual study in that do you really get all the way to having a patient on the cath lab table doing the coronary angiogram with an invasive procedure and then take them off and do this? That's what I would have to do to put this into practice because, as I've said and you've participated with us on, is that randomized trials with stress testing have not demonstrated to us that we can reliably identify those that are at one vessel versus three vessel disease. Now, CTA with FFR or other you know, technologies may become more interesting to us. And I think one of the areas we still need a lot more work is upstream of this to say, when patients are having symptoms, what testing should they get so we can figure out who's in which bucket? And um, in fact, that's a much larger population where we know a lot of opportunity exists because of variation. And we should also perhaps put in a plug for the ischemia trial, of which we're doing the coordinating center at the DCRI. Yeah, absolutely, with Judy Hockman, Dave Marin, and others. I mean, the ischemia trial will do a long ways of answering for us, where are these patients that can get revascularization? What does that benefit? And the good news for us in the ischemia trial is there is a much higher burden of coronary disease. So there will likely be many more patients with two, three-vessel disease. So I think it will help us understand the benefit of that in stable angina patients. Great. Thank you. Thank you for watching.